work? Ah, okay, now. Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, it's my pleasure and honor to moderate and start in the uh, panel which is devoted to democratic learning, freedom to learn, freedom to think. Um, there, there are many panels with a similar or looking similar names. Sometimes there is an overlap We can go probably to the turf of the others. Um, <clears throat> but here I think we target very important issue. Um, one thing is that when the young students go from our part of the world to study abroad, they usually money of taxpayers, American or English, are spent on these people. Five years, and then they come back to the country. All expect that they will make changes, that they got something new in their minds, in their hearts, and they will be promoters of democracy. What happens very often that they successfully adjust to the autocratic rule, authoritarian system, and they actually help the government to strengthen its grip on power. So what is called very often uh, technocrats helping autocrats or serving autocrats. So basically, we, I think what is very important is to distinguish formal education from the education which develops uh, values, creates uh, some deep changes at the level of motivation. And from this point of view, uh, very often for some people, one year or even one week is enough to get that sense of, you know, value. For instance, uh, the Taigif was a very famous, uh, he was an uh, uneducated peasant from Azerbaijan in the early 20th century who was the oil billionaire. And he went abroad to France for the first time in his life from the Baku village, uh, village which is now Baku. And he came back, he spent there one week, and he came back, he said that one thing which impressed him most of all is the high respect for human being and to the freedom of human being. It was early 20th century. What happens with our post-Soviet leaders? When they go abroad, they bring totally different uh, things. They bring beautiful uh, brands, uh, shops, you know, buildings. So what they grasp and gather from the Western life is far from the values. Um, and here we come to the very important thing. When should our democratic education start? First question. Second question, where should it start or to be effective? Should it be in the family? Should it be in the primary school, secondary school? Where should it start? And third, uh, what is the best and most effective way to develop it? If you uh, read the description of the panel, it says that the education should be democratic itself in order to develop the democratic values in children and in students. Whether it's so or not, we can test now because we have a brilliant panel uh, with people. It's a very good combination of various regions and various areas. We have uh, uh, official representatives, uh, a representative on my left, who actually combines a few backgrounds in him both private sector, he was uh, very active in private sector in the past. Um, he's deputy uh, minister of education uh, of uh, Ukraine, uh, Mr. Tiryanka. 
On my right is the civil society educator, a very active and prominent person uh, from India who's been involved in the education projects uh, at the grassroots level for a long time. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> and then we have a scholar academician um, who so brilliantly told us uh, the main concepts around which we may uh, develop our discussion here. So let me start um, um, with... Uh, <sighs> Should I start with you on the left? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, the first question, um, uh, what is the end goal of uh, the education system? Particularly, wh what do you think is the primary goal in uh, Ukraine, for instance, uh, or in transition, any society in tr transition? What are you, and how do you see the ways of achieving those goals and the challenges? If you could briefly tell these three things yeah well, thank you Leila. it's a good question especially for a brief answer <laughs> uh if how, how to briefly uh, and it's uh, it, you know i think about all the all the time about it how you do briefly explain all the challenges of uh, of reforming for instance the educational system to uh of course here's the uh, people more kind of focused on these issues and uh could be easier but uh, when you talk to general public or you talk to to the system itself but uh, I think that uh, the unique if you allow me to take a little bit different perspective I think that the unique situation that we face now uh, in the world globally is that the educational system becomes obsolete not only in countries like the current education existing educational system it becomes a little bit obsolete not only in countries like Ukraine it's it's a it's a global problem it's a global challenge it's it's truly one of the really challenges that are, that are very similar in of course with a lot of different peculiarities but uh, in in an essence they're very similar and uh, what i'm talking about obsolete is that uh, of course in each country and in ukraine as well you would find some very innovative uh, high schools or even kindergartens or uh, secondary schools with very innovative uh, education and where they teach uh, what is needed now and I'm telling a little bit later what is needed to my, in my view but if you take the, the general system and if you take uh, the, the question of the access to education uh, and equality of uh, access to, to high quality education then we face problems probably uh, everywhere except with some exceptions uh, like maybe Finland or some other countries where uh, where they uh, reached much much higher standards for for all and uh, and ex and in Ukraine exactly the challenge is like this so we have uh, some institutions that are very good and uh, that are very advanced and uh, and in general the system is very obsolete especially in s the this the system of school education the general secondary education and here uh, i think the, the 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 greatest challenge is not even in developing the curricula because uh, you you can get together a number of innovators and uh, with good experience and you can quite quickly develop those you know advanced and needed programs uh, but then the, the biggest challenge is how do you implement it in this whole system in ukraine we have more than 17000 general secondary schools if you don't if you don't if you're not taking into account those in the occupied areas like crimea and uh, and we have some 400 more than 400000 teachers and uh, you cannot change them like this like overnight and this is a major challenge and i think that the answer to this challenge uh, uh, and the approach, how you would approach this, lies in the change in this system of, of school management, school governance, and the general uh, kind of uh, local governance of how we manage schools, how we govern them. So this is, this is uh, the, the most important thing uh, for me. That would allow to change, change everything else. But if we talk about where to change, where to go, basically, I, I'm, it's nothing, I, I won't tell nothing new here. Uh, but uh, I, I believe that we should strengthen it uh, again and again. That we we need to change the system so that it teaches the uh, the skills of 21st century. And these skills, if you name it specifically, uh, basically there are three types of skills. 
uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's all kind of new literacies. We just had a panel on economic literacy, and if you take about uh, this, this question about literacy, uh, you, we know that the literacy was the main factor that led the societies from, you know, uh, from very long times to actually advance and, and prosperity and go forward. But if we, if we take about literacy uh, that we needed in 19th or 20th, 20th century, we were very simple stuff. Uh, you, have to, you have to be literate to read, to write, and to in basic math, let's say. Uh, now we need a literacy of different kind. We need the civic literacy, we need a global literacy, we need ICT literacy, we need financial, economic and entrepreneurial literacy. And, and this combination of literacies, uh, this is a major challenge. How would you, how would you uh, actually change the system so that people learn these literacies uh, to the, in a way that, uh, that is democratic and that lets them gain the skills. I, 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 I call them liquid skills, so that, that you not, not only have to teach these new skills, but you also have to think about how they will change in the future and they change constantly. Uh, well, of course, all this kind of thinking skills, problem solving, communication, teamwork, uh, uh, and, and so on, but uh, but this this is basically the the, the challenges that I that I that they think are the most important. And where to start? Just to uh, to conclude, I think we should, we should start everywhere. And uh, my personal view is that we have to start from uh, from educating educating parents to be parents, good parents. And we in Ukraine now creating a kind of uh, institute called the Institute for Modernization of Educational Content, and we create a special uh, structure there that will uh, think about all these literacies and develop curricula for all these literacies, but also uh, the special units that will deal with how do we uh, approach the issue of uh, of uh, helping the parents to to understand better all these skills and to start. Uh, not even teaching the skills, but using the skills uh, in their families so that uh, kids learn, uh, learn the skills in their families. And I think this one, because in my view, these uh, soft skills, they're really, uh, they really learned in families mostly. Uh -huh. That sounds a bit technocratic to me. Um, where do you get the model from, from European uh, states? Any sort of type of education for these literacies or it's something locally developed? Oh, I, I mean, it's, I, I, I can't tell right now where did I get them. It's just in my mind right now. Of, of course, uh, it's uh, as I said, it's it's nothing new about it. The question is how do you how do you implement it so that the whole system functions this way? So, mm -hmm. uh, if we tell, I mean, it's all about common sense. If you tell, well, you need to, but this communication, for example, yeah, the communication like. Uh, 100 years ago, the way to communicate was a little bit different than, than mm -hmm. it is now. So all these skills, they were important all the time. The problem is mm -hmm. that now that it, they are so liquid right now, so that you need to, 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 to adapt to this situation. Uh -huh. So, so I, I, well, I, I can, it's a good question, but I come yeah. back and... and yeah. My other, uh, I want to just confirm whether I understood, is the end goal a responsible citizen striving for free choice? Do you see this image of the average citizen of Ukraine, like responsible citizen I, I think striving that ci for free I think choice. that citizenship, to be good citizen, and the civic literacy, as I go to, yeah, is just one of the dimensions. So the, it's not the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it could be the basic uh, goal mm -hmm. too for, for, other, for other things. So, uh, you know, democracy, you can learn democracy at any age. As, for example, the history of Ukraine shows, you mm -hmm. can learn them during several months of revolution like this, and then you finally you get this revelation that, well, you, mm -hmm. can, you, can, you can be democratic. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can teach, and people uh, are flexible uh, creatures, so they can, they can learn at any age. And mm -hmm. uh, so that, I don't think that it should be the ultimate goal. It's, it's one, of the, one of the elements and one of the basic elements, of course. Okay, we, it's a very interesting government perspective where the state seems to be a leading actor 
in education to democracy, right? Or yeah, you but have but private uh, actors in terms we have of every, education? We have everybody, but we have this Schools. unique situation, yeah. right? We have this unique situation right now in the country that our government really plays this role of, of, uh, uh, of, of a leading force. Of course, in, in yeah. form, well, because, it's yeah. in most of our countries. But now we, uh, with your permission, we transfer to totally different um, part of the world where we have a quite opposite approach, which is promoted from below, and it's a grassroots level, it's something private. But um, our uh, guest of the panel will tell us more about it. Actually, the question that you started with, what's the ultimate uh, objective of education? Mm -hmm. I think that's the most dangerous question. Okay. <laughs> because anyone who tries to answer it uh, creates a centralized system of yeah. education, right? Whether that person is John Dewey or Mao, mm -hmm. whoever that may be, but they're going to design a system which is going to be very centralized, uh, bureaucratic, right? And I see that as the fundamental problem with the system, right? Is the factory style of production in a sense that we have created, right? You put children at the age of four or five, they go from sort of one part of the factory assembly line by year mm -hmm. by year. At the end of the 16th year, they've come out on the other end as if they are a finished product, right? And I think that has to change. Mm -hmm. And that may have worked for the industrial age, but certainly for the knowledge economy, that's not going to be the model uh, that's going to work. So I think also in both ways, in terms of sort of uh, ethically, morally, what's right, and also in terms of what's likely to work, for the 21st century, I think we need to have a very decentralized system of education. Right? Uh, if you just think about it, we all agree that each child is unique. If you provide very standardized, uniform inputs to each child, then the outcome would be quite different across children. Right? If you want to have a similar outcome at the other end, what you need to do the, for each unique child, you have to provide a unique, personalized education. And by doing that, you then create a system where the outcome, which is learning levels, are going to be more equitable. Right? So what has happened uh, around the world, as you said, you know, including, of course, in my own country, in India, uh, the Right to Education Act uh, that we have passed, uh, is focused on access and equity. Right, which is what you mentioned also, that all systems are geared towards that. So access means build more schools, and equity means, well, how can you make sure that the, every school provides equal type of education? One way to make sure is that you standardize the inputs. So every school looks alike. So there's a building that's going to look like this, the classroom size is going to be this, the teachers who work in the classrooms would be, have these qualifications, they will get this amount of salary. So you try to standardize all the inputs with the hope that the outcome would be equitable. But that's exactly the opposite, right? Uh, and I think that standardization, that factory model of education is what has created the problem that we see, right? So what, as you said, not just children should have a right to fire their teachers, uh, as the uh, document says uh, for the program, but I think children and their parents should have a right to choice. Right? And what we need to do is to create those choices across the spectrum, not just choosing a school, but also choosing a curriculum, choosing a method of assessment, right? choosing what subjects I want to learn and what subjects are going to be learned at what period in time. Right? So as opposed to having very standardized common curriculum, syllabus, exams, you need to personalize it. And I think personalization of education is really the ultimate kind of quality education, right? Which is, which is actually what the rich people got, right? The prince and princesses were taught by the most qualified people of the time who came to their home and taught them the subject they wanted to learn, right? And so what was good for the kings and the queens is also good uh, for us, right? Uh, I think that kind of personalized education should be the, ideally the goal, 
Now it's difficult to get there, it will require resources. I think you need to build the system that slowly takes us in that direction. Right? And I think current efforts, even by the UN uh, and these sort of uh, new SDPs, is rather focused on centralized systems. And that usually means government delivery and financing of education. Right? So I'm not against government role in education, but I think that role has to change. It can't be to control, monitor, uh, and decide what's going to be taught. Right? Mm -hmm. In India, for example, with every change in government, the first thing that happens is a change in textbooks. Right? So every government wants to teach what they think is the right history, what they think is the right Indianness. Mm -hmm. right? And every time there's a huge battle. Right? And who pays the price? the students and the parents pay the price, and the society at large. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think this standardization, the question that there is one single purpose of education, uh, that itself has to be challenged. Mm -hmm. There is no one purpose for life. Mm -hmm. right? What's the ultimate goal of life? Well, depends. Okay, <laughs> for now, each individual, mm -hmm. is different. Now we have already emerging this sort of tension between approaches to uh, education, free education. Uh, should it be um, dominated by state or should it be uh, decentralized or personalized? We know it's a very <laughs> serious well, well, I'm debate. So, I'm sorry, there's no tension because, no? I <laughs> because I never said that the education should be dominated by state okay. or I never said that it should be centralized. Decentralization of education is exactly what we are doing now as a, okay. as a, as a state and as a government. Okay. Uh, just because the role of the government could be different and it's time specific, country specific and it's kind of very and again uh, we're here we're completely the same as in India so our current achievements are not the achievements due to the role of the government it's the achievements that we have are the achievements that also go from bottom the point is that how we use this knowledge and this experience and mm -hmm. transfer it to the to the whole system mm -hmm. and uh, we, we just have now the leading role because if you go to polls I just mentioned it in the previous panel in Ukraine we just had recent polls uh, only a little bit more than 30% of teachers in schools think that they need some changes. The 70% say everything is fine. I mean, we have a good system. Everything is okay. We just just give us more salaries, and and, and the rest is fine. Uh, maybe we could ask our academician philosopher to tell us: uh, Is it basically possible to apply the most democratic methods of education, regardless whether it's a state system or decentralized system? Uh, what, what can be done? I mean, does it depend um, on... Well, I, I, I would start with uh, my own experience. Maybe you Is should uh, turn on the microphone. I think it's not... It's on. It's on? It's on. Okay. It's a little bit closer, yeah. Do you hear me? Now, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Great. I would start with my experience. Uh, I Well, first of all, I'm more interested in university studies, uh, but ma uh, many things which we can say about uh, education at the universities may apply to lower level schools. My experience was such, uh, I came to the States, to Berkeley, from, he from here. We had a totalitarian communist system here, and there was a little possibility in 1968 to leave the country. So I went to Berkeley to study, and I was surprised by two things. First, how students were interfering with the uh, teacher. They were asking things, they were claiming that uh, something is different, that the teacher said. So sort of freedom of thoughts uh, appeared uh, very visibly. And second observation was, Unlike as in our country, uh, th there is a sort of competition among students. They, uh, this is something like in sport. If you uh, are doing a race with somebody, you would not help. But uh, this doesn't mean that, it, that there is an animosity. Uh, the classification in, uh, in the States was, maybe still is, relative. That means uh, in a relation to the average in the class. So uh, there is not absolute 
guiding, like you know, country that uh, somebody is good or bad, and uh, that, that's all. So I mentioned a certain type of freedom and certain type of competition. And in fact, there is a maybe superficial similarity with uh, the concept of democracy, which is traditionally, uh, uh, let's say, the, the one thing which is for everybody visible on democracy uh, is free and uh, free competition in elections, free competition of parties, uh, Ideally, uh, parties represent ideas. That is a competition of ideas. Uh, and it's a free and, uh, uh, and competing. Now, uh, can we apply this, this uh, similarity a little more in education? What I think, and I would refer to your first question about the purpose or goal of uh, education, is in, in not to uh, to lead to very special uh, professional uh, education. The students should not be very narrow, specialized uh, people. They should have a, a spectrum of various, first of all, of various uh, professional, uh, various, uh, uh, let's say, sciences different sciences, but also different opinions. In science, and especially in humanities, there is not unity of, uh, unity of uh, uh, th thinking. Ap approach. Think. Okay. There is a diversity that some people have a different approach than others, but their goal is the same. They, they perhaps want to uh, get closer to the truth about the world. Uh, so, in, especially in universities, uh, the, the students should be exposed to many various ideas and, of course, many various uh, teams. And as far as uh, competition is concerned, um, there is a, a, a strange uh, similarity, which is not actual similarity. There is no competing people or competing uh, institutions or parties. What is competing are ideas. And if, for, if, if for instance, you have a different approach to the Big Bang, and somebody else has another uh, theory of Big Bang, these theories, in a sense, may compete. But they would, uh, the, the uh, important question is not how to evaluate who is better and who is worse, because um, uh, there should be based on a, uh, on a real uh, death of uh, knowledge in that approach. Actually, this is open question. But what I would claim is it's not proper when uh, various approaches and results and publications or everything is evaluated according to some pragmatic way uh, that it helps in the concrete thing or something like that which in science is very, uh, very often that uh, um, the more applicable and even the more productive financially uh, research, the more uh, it is supported. How to achieve uh, a different way, I don't know. Uh, maybe you will advise. Uh, did I understand you correctly that competition is the key condition for uh, formation of, let's say, critical thinking. Yeah, uh, not, uh, we haven't heard that yet about critical thinking. Is well, it one uh, of the key sort of features we're trying to achieve? Because we're all coming from the, uh, you know, totalitarian uh, system. 
And what we see now, for instance, going on in Russia under brainwashing uh, uh, conditions, uh, very lack of critical thinking, uh, I think, which would cre create sort of resistance to the propaganda. And uh, maybe that's why we're so vulnerable to influence of this propaganda exactly because we don't have skills of critical thinking and uh, we uh, were not used to make choices, we're not used to look for alternatives and uh, that's what is created by competition, right, Doctor? Yes, uh, I think the critical thinking is something very linked to a competition. Uh, what I had on mind is a competition of idea which we have, let's say, the same um, attract, they are attractive in the same way. Now, uh, when we learn to, uh, to this uh, de debate between various opinions, at the same time we learn to be critical. Because if I want to support my opinion, I have to be critical to your opinion. And of course, then there is the political side of that. When, the, uh, when uh, somewhat we know what is correct, uh, I'm not sure about that, but, uh, uh, but um, uh, if I know what is correct, I would be critical to uh, others, but the criticism should not be according to me, like uh, I am correct because I am right. <laughs> Uh, without any arguments. I have to somewhat to prove that I am correct. No, I, yeah, what I meant is actually to be critical to the information you receive, to ask questions, to um, sort of, that's what I meant. Um, may, may, maybe you could refer to that. What, what uh, do you think would be the uh, outcome of competition as a result? I think the choice that I talked about earlier the competition is the other side of the coin. Right? The choice and competition go together. So if the parents are going to have choice in terms of what they want to study, which school they want to go, that means those schools uh, and teachers and principals would have to compete to attract and retain students. Because that is how they are going to be able to uh, get the financing they need. Uh, and so in that sense, the system of choice and competition creates those incentives, mm -hmm. which would be either for critical thinking, could be for generally 21st century skills, because we know it's not so much learning, but learn how to, learning how to learn is far more important, right? And therefore, the schools will be forced to innovate much faster uh, than currently what they do. I mean, if you think about it, the education model hasn't really changed in the last 200 years, right? The same model of one classroom, some person standing in front of the class and few people sitting uh, on the other side, right? And that model pretty much has continued even now, by and large. Mm -hmm. So I think education is the least sort of reformed area of our life, mm -hmm. right? And my sense is the reason why that is the case is because we have centralized the thinking about education systems, right? And the state dominance uh, in delivering that education. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that has remained, I mean, I'm always surprised when I go to European countries and see the school bus. It looks like the 19th century, right? So in the US, for example, if you look at the school bus, it's the only bus on the road that is that way, right? No other bus even run by the uh, <laughs> private uh, transport companies look at, looks any like, anything like the school bus. So I think the centralization is a central the key problem, and a competition would address that problem, right? Now, I know, talking about the role of government, uh, think about this. We want to make sure that everybody has food, nobody starves. How does government is able to assure that? Does government go out and produce food and give it to the people? No. It, farmers are actually private, and, private enterprises. They produce food, governments buy from them some places. Most places, government simply uses a food voucher or a food coupon to make sure the poor have access to the same food that other people do. Right? So government's role is largely in financing, in providing the enabling condition to access the market, which you may not be able to access because you don't have the resources of purchasing power to access. 
right? And so I think that's the role for government as it is in guaranteeing food security, should be also in case of education to guarantee education to all children. That's a very uh, specific sort of practical issue, but uh, I think our countries are uh, experiencing this problem of formation of identity. And that's why the role of the state is becoming quite important because uh, that's, uh, that's it, what is behind the concept of education also, the ident identity. Um, so maybe we have different issues at stake, mm, uh, India and <laughs> post-Soviet space. I think that Leila, what you just said is that actually uh, thank you for this word identity because we just just discussed critical thinking mm -hmm. and in my mind critical thinking ends where identity begins and for example the problem with Russia is not is not about uh, I know so many very well educated people in Russia that can can sustain you know against this propaganda not because they don't have critical thinking skills they have perfect critical thinking skills in other areas but as long as it doesn't touch their identity. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the identity, then critical th thinking ends, you know, it's full stop. And I think it's everywhere, probably, in the world, you know. But and before you don't touch the identity, yeah. then it's okay, you, are, you can, you know, ask questions, and, you, uh, and then, you know, to question your own identity, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult. I mean, it's, uh, it's maybe like few people could be able to do this uh, in the whole world. So, uh, and this is and this is the major thing. How do how we, and this exactly about the question, because the question of the panel is uh, has both you know it has very <coughs> technical perspective from one hand, how you actually give this access to free education and uh, the freedom to think, freedom to learn, and this is the more from one hand it's very kind of technical stuff in in today's world is that is that. We have, with modern technology, we, we are able now to give more and more access uh, to quality content to larger groups of people remotely and so on. Uh, and from this perspective, it's a techable issue because you can, and, and as never before. Mm -hmm. For example, in Ukraine, we're now going to, tackling the specific problem of how do we continue to provide education to those children then left in occupied territories how do we provide education for them so that they still remain in the in the field of ukrainian education so to say right mm -hmm. uh, we decided there's no other means uh, of course some children they, they who escape from that areas they can go to normal school and and, and study there uh, and but but for those who can't go because they had no money or their parents are you know have different perspective and so on. So the only way, of course, to offer an online online education. But what we're going to do, basically, this is one of the projects that we're going to launch next year, and we are now approving the budget for this, and hopefully uh, everyone understands that it's so important, is that we want to create not only just an online, more than online platform that would be free of charge, but we also want to take the best teachers uh, and the best, let's say, best of the class you know, uh, programs and they will be recorded uh, with all the modern things like this. And of course, when we put it in place, for it will be open not only for for children from occupied areas, it will, they will be also open for everyone else. So people's pupils and kids from from uh, areas in Ukraine where they don't have they, they, where where they have access only to this, you know, one teacher standing in front with probably not the best skills, they would be able then to go home and uh, go to this online school and then have lessons and classes and questions from the best teachers in the country and probably also in the world. We are thinking about also of translating and do a, uh, um, dubbing of some best uh, classes of, uh, of, world, of teachers from the, all over the world. So basically you immediately create a kind of revolution because, uh, I mean, if I would have that access during Soviet times to to that you know, content, not just to that that, that we got in our schools, and, and hundreds of thousands more students, probably the situation would change much quicker. So from technical perspective, it's quite of, uh, un understandable how to tackle. But from the perspective of, uh, of, of identities, of, of how do we uh, create a sense of, for example, I don't know, 
um, global citizenship or tolerance, for instance. Huge critical issues that we have now, like uh, LGBT, for instance, in our countries. It's a, such, such a difficult thing, you know, even with the most educated people. And, this, and these things are, are, are I think that uh, these identical things are the major, the major challenge, I think. Because, very good that you touched upon these issues, because my question was uh, planned to be that what do you think is the most uh, difficult uh, legacy which you have to tackle now in your education system? So you basically responded, it's inclusive, it's tolerant thinking, it's uh, critical thinking, it's um, probably initiative, right? Initiative, how, how about... Uh... I mean, with initiativeness and with proactivity, we have pretty much, uh, I mean, uh, as long as you start to deliver these opportunities, uh, I don't think that we, we lack proactive people. We are pretty much okay with proactive people. And a uh, couple of revolutions within eight years, it's, it's more or less good evidence about it. Mm -hmm. so. But uh, you, um, you found a way which combines both freedom of education and accessibility, affordability, right? The projects which you are running, they are not private, they don't require... They are not expensive, right? They are not, don't require big investments. And at the same time, they resolve the issue of the education for the poor, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Do you think that we need to get that sort of experience for our um, society? But again, so we don't face in our societies due to one of the, uh, let's say, not the worst legacies of, this, of the Soviet system was that the general, uh, the general secondary education was pretty much good level. I mean, and, and we don't face the issues like people face in governments face in India or in the United States, where there's no access to, to education, education at all, let's say. And, uh, <coughs> you know, I just came across, we yesterday, well, a couple of days ago, we had a big conference in Ukraine, the Yalta European Strategy, with big leaders like Tony Blair and Shimon Peres and and uh, it's, a, it's, it's an annual conference uh, it's for the, held for the 12th time. And one of the uh, billionaires out of Australia was there, and he's now one of the leaders in the world of technical slavery. And how, how much do we know about slavery, for instance? No, I was so impressed, because you don't, you don't deal with slavery like all the time, but uh, the estimated number of people in modern slavery today is more than 35 million people. 61% of these people are located in five countries. Mm -hmm. <coughs> China, India, Russia, Pakistan, Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. Both in terms of absolute numbers and in terms of uh, and those different ratings, in terms of percent of population. I was amazed to use that in Ukraine, it's estimated that more than 100,000 people also uh, in the modern, modern types of slavery. It's not, of course, it's not like slavery that it was like hundred years ago, but it's more than, it's more than slavery that can be uh, identified as a slavery. And, and, uh, and so that's why, so what, what I'm trying to say is that the, the situations, for, from one hand, the situation in education is very country specific. In some countries they face issues of access to very basic education. In some countries they face issues of how do you create uh, a individualized education for all, because the basic system is, is in place. Uh, what I think you meant is ideal society would create the, such conditions that individual potential, creative potential will flourish under these conditions. That's what he meant, yeah. No, I, I think we do it in all other parts of our life. Mm -hmm. It's not really ideal society where only where you can have this kind of a condition. Mm -hmm. It's pretty easy to do in almost any society. Mm -hmm. Of course, it may function differently given the context in which you are creating the system, right? But the example they were, that you were citing earlier about India uh, is a school voucher system, right? A voucher actually is given to poor parents who are then able to use the voucher uh, to, to the school of their choice, right? So government basically empowers you with the financial resources uh, in the form of a voucher, and then you can take the voucher, go to your school, 
that is that serves the best interest of your child right so that is actually customization that is very much like you know, making the choice uh, like you choose a candidate or a political party uh, for an office in a way right so democracy in action which we see in political arena can easily be replicated uh, in the education arena right mm-hmm. and the similarly like political parties can come from nowhere right in india what has happened uh, in the last 20 years of economic reforms uh, is that we have so many private schools coming up not for the rich and most in most countries private schools are generally for the very upper class uh, uh, part of the society right uh, obama's kids uh, in they go to private uh, private school in washington dc uh, but there are these are the private schools for the poor right and these are the schools they charge about 3 4 5 dollars a month uh, as a tuition fee right and they provide pretty decent education Mm-hmm. actually at least better than what you can get in a government school mm-hmm. right and a government school actually spends almost 6 to 10 times more mm-hmm. per student than this budget private schools for the poor mm-hmm. spend uh, in these schools right so almost one sixth the cost in a sense uh, what government spends you get a higher quality education in a private school mm-hmm. right but given the notion that everything should be standardized the government of india is closing down the schools mm-hmm. because they do not meet the infrastructure norms they don't have the proper buildings uh, the classroom size is not as big as they would like to have right and these schools run in, in slum areas where nobody has proper building <laughs> right <laughs> so how are you going to build a school which is in a proper building Uh, all rooms are very small it is a very congested area in a city like bombay or delhi right so it is impossible to meet the infrastructure norms uh, but if you count the outcome they actually provide much higher quality education right okay. so what has happened in the name of equity that we have dist- we are destroying what's actually delivering better quality education Mm-hmm. so today some of the states in india are closing down this budget private schools because they don't meet the norms so instead of in the name of right to education we are actually taking away the opportunity that poor children had before right? i think that's what i'm worried about in the larger discourse uh with the un goals and all of that the focus has always been something which is standardized which is given to everyone in some standardized form right uh, now management could be decentralized but the idea remains that it has to look something which is common mm-hmm. and that is the way you can achieve equitable education and we have to understand that you can get equitable equitable education by personalized education not by standardized education mm-hmm. personalized okay um now we, i i give the uh, floor to our professor could you maybe uh, generalize or give sort of uh, more uh, ideas of what we were discussing here you uh, to do because you've got this very interesting classification or uh, different levels of internalization of democratic values during education all these w- which was spoke uh, we were speaking about now different modes of education system uh how will it transform into the internalization of democratic values will it produce the more democratically thinking people um which type of education do you think what should we achieve because you said about uh, empirical uh, education of democracy then practical education of democracy so what is lacking Uh, yeah the, uh, it's a many question in in one uh, sentence um i i always th- i am always thinking more about ideal situation because i think it is more fun <laughs> it's uh, it's challenging and we are in a comp- complicated situation that most of the countries especially those represented in this forum uh, have a problem with the government or with the rulers or something like that and uh, therefore they they are not uh, in the position of talking about ideal situation 
But there are some concepts which I think is, uh, should be taken into consideration, whatever level of uh, context we are talking about. One of them is diversity. Um, we know from nature that diversity is something very, very positive. Uh, we, we would not be here if there were no diversity and therefore evolution in, uh, in nature. And now the question is uh, to, to what extent it applies to ideas and perhaps to strategies how to educate youngs. Uh, uh, in fact, I, uh, well, there is a one problem which maybe uh, you touched a little bit, is the, uh, the, the general opinion, if I pay something, I should have the control on that. And uh, this is a very sensitive point in uh, when the state is the main um, actor. So, main actor, so, so budget. Because a state should uh, have a, if, if it was a person, but it is not a person, mm -hmm. uh, could have a feeling that they should therefore have the right to, to control. The control. Um, private schools uh, have the advantage that they are controlled by people who pay uh, that, them. which are a community, or I do not know what, and therefore. Uh, it helps to diversity. Uh, of course, uh, sometimes the diversity is, uh, is negative. Um, and this is what I uh, have the experience in this country where we were, well, first, it was uh, forbidden to be diverse. Uh, second is that we uh, were uh, not on the on the side of the Communist Party, uh, had a feeling that, uh, we sh uh, that uh, they are not correct, simply not correct. Uh, they are wrong, and we are good, therefore. And uh, so the, the, there are situations when the, the diversity should be somewhat dumped uh, in favor of um, deeper understanding of the situation. Thank you so much. I think we, we need now to address certain questions from the audience. Yeah, we have, um, I don't know who else, oh, two of you. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your points of view. Uh, I have a question for Jan. Uh, you said most of you would um, address the question of this panel. I, was, I came here and only Mr. Havel somewhat touched it. Uh, I understood that we would be discussing freedom to think, which then leads to freedom to, to express, mostly in words, and, and freedom to learn. And I feel that some of it was wandering off in more specific direction, uh, okay. different direction. Thank mm -hmm. you. Maybe we should uh, collect the questions, and then you, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about the critical thinking, and you also mentioned that there is a lack of critical thinking in our society. So my question is maybe, uh, who is going to teach our parents and uh, our teachers to think critically so then they can actually educate? <laughs> Uh, our kids to have those critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No one else? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Viera Rabkova, Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Let me first thank to all panelists. I fully agree that perhaps the topic which we discussed was a little bit different from what was on the program, but nevertheless, uh, I think that we should all of us appreciate very great task which is in front of the Deputy Minister uh, of Ukraine and uh, Mr. Mr. Shah from India because to educate 
or to change the educational system or to provide education to millions of children in India. This is a very, very great task and uh, it deserves definitely our appreciation. There was also a question, if, to, if education is more to private or more the governmental task, I definitely think that it should be one of the priorities of each and every government. Education is investment. And to invest into education from the very beginning, it's something, I think, very, very big goal, and we should press our governments to do so. Also, to uphold position of teachers. It means to give them, again, prestigious position in the society, I mean from the basic schools up to, of course, universities, to give them decent salaries and to really consider this profession as to be very, very important. Uh, and let me just, because we are there to criticize thinking, uh, uh, in the Czech schooling system, which we remember, my generation from the childhood, there was a style to not to look at good sides or to look at abilities of the child, but to criticize him for the things which the child is not able to do. If you are not good in mathematics, let it sit and, and, and work hours and hours and hours. On the other side, children should be supported in what they are very good and to educate them as from their own. And their abilities where, where their abilities are not that good, simply to let them be. But back to critical thinking, how to develop critical thinking of our teachers, of our parents, etc. This is still a very big question. Any more questions? Uh, okay, uh, uh, there uh, the second round. Okay, okay, why don't you start? Okay, first yeah, question. Well, maybe yeah, maybe yeah. we start a little bit because, uh, yeah. uh, again, huge questions. No, they're really clear. I, I, um, I agree that we probably went into two instrumental kind of technical things, but I a little bit disagree that we didn't uh, discuss the freedom to think and freedom to learn. We just don't name these words, but when we talk about uh, individualized uh, education uh, or changing the programs or decentralization, it's all basically about the, the means that bring us to this, to enabling more freedom to learn the freedom to think. In idealistically, of course, in an ideal world, we imagine that each human being during his life path, if we're talking about lifelong education, has an access at each period of time, an, an access and opportunity according to his age, according to all this you know, psychology of, uh, of age and according to his it has an access and ability to estimate correctly his talents and to explore them fully and the education system should be there to help each human being at each moment of his time to ident identify at the best level his talents and to help him or her to explore this these talents. So maybe this is kind of uh, an ultimate goal. So we create this, uh, again, it's an ideal, 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 ideal uh, system for me. So the system itself is there to help the, do these two things. But when we talk about system, we, we, we here we actually talk in this broad term, so we never uh, specify about what we're talking about. High education system, general secondary education, pre-school education, uh, different levels of education, then different kinds of education. We're talking about formal, non-formal, informal, and so on. So it's a very huge, uh, huge thing. But I think that the way to achieve more freedom to think and more freedom to learn is to, first of all, to fully explore the, uh, the modern you know, technologies. And technologies give us enormous opportunities right now, provided there's, a, there's not an autocratic uh, regime Technology gives us a lot of opportunities to enable more freedom to learn, at least, that sh that, uh, for, for much larger audiences. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and this is about the freedom to learn. So we, the freedom to learn, if we consider, for example, that, the, that, that we all have this freedom to learn from the very beginning, but who start, begins to suppress this freedom to learn? Generally, 
in our countries, the first people who start to suppress freedom to roam are parents towards their kids. Uh, I thought that Generally. was a poverty, no? We had a tremendous collapse yes, of the of Soviet course. system. Of course, yeah. There but are people, children begging in the but streets. But these are, these are the circumstances, the circumstances that, of course, help, help yeah. too. But you can find a lot of wealthy or at least, uh, you know, with moderate income, you know, people uh, that, that suppress the freedom to learn for their kids just because they were educated this way and so on yeah. and so forth. And they say, and they, on the other hand, this balance between where there's freedom to learn and where there's the, the role of a parent or of a tutors to actually help this child to navigate a little bit. Uh, and it's also important so, to find this balance. And this balance probably is just a guess of mine. And this balance is probably very specific to the, to the um, to, the, to, to, to the overall, let's say, stage of the development of the of the society and and the and, and human and human beings as as creatures. Let's there say there was a question also about who will teach critical thinking our teachers and be, our uh, parents. Who? Will <laughs> who? who? Yeah. yeah, for for me, I mean, mm -hmm. it should be taught at all levels. Now, first of all, in families, and then and in schools. And uh, but how do we? In my personal challenge, how do we? Do, how do we manage that we start teaching critical thinking in schools and we, uh, let's say, re-educate some 400,000 teachers? Uh, my answer is uh, that, as, as I mentioned at the very beginning, that we can do it through uh, decentralization of, of educational system and through uh, liberalizing the standards. So, and very specifically, it would, it would mean the following. So what we're thinking now, for example, as in universities, in Ukraine, we just passed a new law last year, and it will sound very uh, funny probably here, you know, uh, but for the first time in history, we allowed for our universities to be independent in, in, uh, in their academic programs. So before it was until last year, it was fully standardized, so there were obligatory subjects that you had to study in the university, whatever, and, and so on. So now it's, it's free. But now we want to go further, and of course it's a very huge task for these universities to actually use this right properly, because they're not ready. 90% of universities are not ready for this freedom, neither, neither for academic freedom nor for financial freedom that we provide right now. But then the next step, what we're going to do, if we, we want to change the system for, for the schools, so that the curricular uh, is uh, standardized maximum by 70 to 80 percent. And then it, it could be, so there's uh, some standards to which they, and then, uh, uh, I mean this, even the standards, uh, the, the national curriculum, but then they, it could be, and teachers should, be, should have this freedom to, to change it uh, and to experiment. And, uh, and, and again, so, but this, these means are uh, the means of management. So the school management and the centralization, uh, in my opinion, are those means that can enable more freedom to learn and more freedom to, to think. Thank you. Uh, anyone wants to comment on? Uh, I would uh, just uh, like a comment because the, uh, some of the questions raise the issue of parents and teachers. Uh, th th there is a paradoxical situation that, in spite of that, uh, basically students are less knowledgeable than their teachers. Uh, the, the knowledge goes up. Uh, so, therefore, uh, is the question how it comes when the student is better than the teacher, when uh, he or she recognizes the, the wrong ideas uh, which they are taught. Should they uh, do something with that or not? This is part of the question. The second part is how to recognize the better uh, comparing to the boss. Because if the selection process would be uh, like in biology, which I already mentioned, uh, then the selection process should really select the better. And this would be the only way how even with, with uh, this, let's say, teachers, professor at the university or so, are less, not so genius as their students, uh, that it's possible. And uh, the, the best students should be teachers in a sense. Uh, not, of course, not all of them, uh, but um, some of them. 
And this would raise the level. But it's not no relation to de democracy in what I'm saying. Or maybe it is, but... I would like just to add from Azerbaijani experience. We had a school of political studies, former Partine Shkola, and the uh, teachers, the, the students who graduated from that school, they were confronting their former teachers directly on political ideas. It's very interesting. How come? And you see this person, I, I, this is the product of that person. But he's a bearer of totally different values already. And I think that it's very important to distinguish between knowledge of values, knowledge of something, and the values being internalized and becoming a motivation of your actions. I spent one year at Harvard. That was my first more or less lengthy presence abroad in the West. I was not impressed by the education process, simply because there was such a high pressure of uh, reputation that you hardly heard any question from the students addressed to the teacher. Um, so there was not this sort of very lively debate uh, environment, at the classes at least, which I attended. But what I brought from the United States in one year, it's a notion of liberalism. And that was the main acquisition for me, the ideas of liberal ideology and things like that. We have other examples. People come, they study in American universities or in uh, European universities, as I said, for five years, six years. They come back and then they easily join the authoritarian system. And I think this is very important. How come that education system, which is by definition is democratic by itself, it's supposed to develop the democratic ideas, the democratic motivation and values, how come it is not working? And I would like to address uh, the issue which uh, Professor Havel mentioned, that this is the third level of learning democracy. It's the uh, learning democracy in practice. And I think that's where I got this idea of liberalism. It was not even from the life in the campus, because it was very boring, <laughs> but it was somewhere else in the other um, various sort of uh, lacunas and you know, situations in America surrounding uh, the Harvard University and some relationship which I was involved. So that was a practice uh, of developing. So maybe we should not expect too much from uh, the education system or uh, we, we can expect much. I think that this, the, the, the thing is that we can't expect it only from the university system. I think we should start really early in f formation of personality, really very early in the, the school, primary school. Um, we, we missed some people who wanted to ask questions. Who was that? Yes, you please. Mm -hmm. We are talking all the time about, uh, yes, we are talking all the time about democracy and education. Um, I have the suspect that somebody is still thinking that democracy is a system. There is no such a thing as a democratic system. Democracy is a target. A target that we can reach with different systems. There are systems that are more democratic, others that are less democratic, and this is changing with the time. So we cannot teach democracy. It's like thinking that we can teach critical thinking. It's a nonsense. We can prepare, organize a school in a way that critical thinking may arise, that is, a, uh, is accepted, is tolerated. That is possible. So it's a matter of organization. And then a democratic school, in first instance, is a school open to everybody. It's a school that is uh, not uh, <coughs> selecting uh, pupils according to the budget of the family. That is the main problem. It's a school that allows to everybody to reach the upper grades according to their capabilities. Um, I am German, I come from Germany. Germany is in Europe, the 
uh, the country where the school is the less democratic. Strange enough, but all the uh, research in this field show that it's the less democratic school. Because if your parents are academic, you have 80% of possibility or 90 to become academic. But if your parents are workers, you have just 20%. Where it's in Germany? That is the, the, the problem of democracy. That, uh, if we talk for democratic school, we must think that there is no such thing as a democratic school in a country that is not democratic. And though we have example of schools that are not so democratic, even in a country that is supposed to be a democratic system. But as I told before, there is nothing like a democratic system. It's like saying there is a, a shoe that is, um, uh, is suitable for all feet and for all <laughs> place where you work. No, there is in each country in the world a different need. There is a need, different development. And so the school cannot just be a, a changing mirror of the society. The school may change society. Society may change school, but you cannot teach democracy. And also, I think, uh, critical thinking grows out of the organization. I must say, when I was a pupil, I learned more critical thinking from a teacher that was almost a fascist, because all what he was saying <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> developed uh, a reaction. Resistance to what? that. No. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, anyone? Else, any question? Okay, that too. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, my name is Michaela Kring, and I'm a Danish high school student, and I have a question for all the panelists. Um, many of you have said now that you believe the best school system is where um, the student has freedom to choose their own way and, and what they want to study, which is actually what we do in Denmark. Already at the age of 14 and 15, the students have to choose to want to study natural sciences or social sciences. But um, what I want to ask you, and what we're struggling with in Denmark, is that the students, they can't decide already, which is why they decide to take a gap year, prolong their, um, their studying. So it takes a longer time for the students to go out into the society and work and, and gain money for the, for the society. Um, and also, we've had some issues with too many students not picking natural sciences, so we have a lack of that. So I just want to ask you, what are the solutions to this? Uh -huh. And the next question, yeah, there was. Yeah, my name is Emily, and I'm also, also a high school student. Um, I'd like to ask, because there was a lot of discussion about um, the, yeah, the critical thinking, um, and I'd like to ask, that how will you assure that we can actually learn this critical thinking and learn to reflect on our own identity as well? I think it was Oleg mentioning that critical thinking um, ends when identity begins, but doesn't critical thinking actually, like, isn't it included in your identity, that you can actually reflect on your own perspective? And does that not make you, like, is that not a part of being a citizen, both globally and nat uh, nationally? And also the democratic values comes with the reflectiveness, I guess. So I'd like to hear your opinion on that. Thank you. And the last question probably yeah. will have, okay, mm -hmm. please. Yeah, my name is Rainer Adam. I'm also German, and that's why I was prompted by my fellow German to contradict him. I teach democracies in 30 years. I'm a product of a German education system, and I know that there are many, many, at many, many levels, at different schooling, schools or other educational institutions, mechanism which provide for participation and so on. It starts with maybe uh, electing among the students their speaker, you know, who takes up to be the spokesman, a spokesperson for for the students. That starts very early, you know, my daughter was elected when she was eight or so because she competed uh, for that position. So this is just a little example. I could uh, go on, but I just had to contradict my fellow countrymen. Thank you. <laughs> Comment. So th does anyone want to respond to, to questions by high school students? We, of course, we, we want to respond, and we have to, we're here, we're here to re respond to questions. And uh, I, first of all, I would like to thank for this notion, even not to the question, but to the notion. Uh, I would admire society where, you know, people have this identity, when the critical thinking is a part of the identity, not part of, of, of skills or, let's say, attributes or, or, or features, because, because I, I, I mean, but I think that it's very, 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 we're, we're very, you know, 
far away from, from at least in our countries, to have a critical mass, even not, not in the whole society, let's say, but at least a critical mass of people that would have the critical thinking as part of their, as part of their identity. Uh, in most part of the world, uh, the typical identity would be an ethnic identity or an identity to kind of uh, a national identity, so to which nation you belong or to which, whether it's superpower or not superpower, or to spiritual identity, religious identity. So those uh, basic identities, uh, and of course the, uh, these basic identities like national identity, ethnical, spiritual, religious, and, uh, and things like this, they, they uh, prevent people from moving to this critical thinking identity, where, they, where, they, where the identity starts to be, I'm a human being, and I'm here to explore, and I'm part of the world, and so on. And it's, uh, I think the world is too far away from this, but it's moving in this direction, uh, to my mind, and. Uh, we are on the right track, more or less, I, I believe, but uh, but it's still a very long way to go to. <laughs> and uh, in terms of the, there's a there's a very interesting thing that, uh, from one hand, it's very good that you make a choice from at age 15, or 14 or 15, uh, in which direction to specialize, but from the other hand, uh, there's a danger in this as well because sometimes it could be. It could be just uh, too early. In some countries, even in Europe, they, um, I think it's in Austria, they, in Austria they, they uh, cho well, let's say they make a choice of in which direction to study even earlier, and, and now they want to change it because they, they, uh, they've uh, uh, decided that they do it too early, and, uh, and, and basically they limit this freedom to learn for for their for their pupils if they identify where to go in which direction at a very early stage, uh, we now in Ukraine we we want to more or less move to 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 the system because we don't have 12 year system typical like primary school secondary and then specialized. Uh, we just want to implement it and of course it's very important for us to learn uh, all the benefits or risks of each particular system. Uh, I, I think that it's really individually specific of whether you can make it your... Me, for instance, at, at age 15, I, I want to be a scientist in physics. And I really wanted to go to the, to the university and study physics. And uh, I was like studying physics, math and all this stuff. But then when I was graduating from school, things changed and I changed my mind and I decided, well, I'm, I'm, I think I better do this and I went to study international relations so and economics. And uh, so I think it's uh, the, the most important thing is that the system allows you to actually change your path at any age you want to change it as long as you mm -hmm. uh, start to discover some other interests and so on. And that would be the best, uh, the best is, ideal is system. Is LGBT issue in textbooks in Ukraine? Not yet, but I believe it would be. So. Because I think social networks, at least in my country, is now the uh, substitution of textbooks. So people are very oh. uh, actively discussing the issue of uh, LGBT. And I think the civil society is having the leading role in trying to bring this issue to the more or less sort of public awareness directed to a sort of civilized um, direction and things like that. So do, do you have any comment to the questions? Just that I'm very jealous of the students from Denmark. <laughs> uh, I, didn't, I didn't get to choose a course even in college, mm -hmm. let alone in a school, right? Uh, and I think I agree that all that you need to do is to make sure the people are able to go back and forth. Uh, for example, in my case, I studied science in college and after I wanted to study economics. Uh, but in India, you could not go back to humanities once you have taken the subject of science, right? Uh, and then I had really had to leave the country in order to do economics. <laughs> so uh, it could be other extreme in the sense uh, of what you have. But I think choice is always going to be a good way of figuring out what you want to do as long as you are not stuck in that one particular choice that you made. Mm -hmm. and you are free to move around depending on your interest, right? And the gap year, I think, is a great thing. And there are many people who think that we are just forcing ourselves to go from high school to college, college to 
postgraduate or MBA programs, and it just continues for 20, 25, 26 years of education, which probably is not really necessary uh, in any case, right? So I think breaking up your education with some work experience uh, that you're able to gain, uh, it's, you will realize that when you grow up, <laughs> when you are in Mysore, you would see that uh, getting, uh, getting all education in one go is not really a great thing. Uh, I would like to just to comment on that. Uh, I rationalized uh, yeah, that this uh, critical thinking, which is self-critical and which is not self-critical. Uh, both extremes may be uh, not proper, because, but I think that the first one has to learn uh, certain critical attitudes towards others, not, uh, not including myself into the question. And when I learn it, then I would be able to self-criticize as well, uh, to be careful what I think, whether it's correct or not or so. Now, in education, in education, I believe that the, the way how to uh, uh, how to show people what is criticism is uh, looking on history, on history of ideas. It's independent on whether it's a physics or biology or chemistry or so social sciences or philosophy, uh, just to be exposed to situations when there was a competition of ideas, and perhaps one of them won a long time ago, so I am not involved. But later, when I see this, that the possibility and the options of various, well, there was a phlogiston theory in chemistry which was overcome or so, so I would be more self-critical to my own opinions. Yes, and actually, yeah, we'll um, just refer to who will teach our parents. I mean, you <laughs> and we <laughs> will teach our parents and similarly our teachers. Because I think the source of democratic values is not just the school or university. It's social networks, it's information which you get through various sources, it's your practice of democratic struggle. It's your communication with other people. It's the uh, multiple activities. Look, we had only a bunch of dissidents in the Soviet times. And suddenly, who were they uh, to build a new democratic society? In Poland, in Czech Republic, there were thousands. Where did they come from? From a new education system? I don't think so. They got the education in uh, squares, in Maidans in you know, everyday practice and everyday. I got my uh, also a huge school from LGB, first president, who was teaching us of tolerance, standing there with a million people out there in the square and calming down people who were unhappy with his opponent who was speaking. He was showing that we should respect the different opinion. That was not gaining from school, uh, gain from school. So um, that's my understanding what to do. Of course, civil society can play the role of, re, of training and re-educating the older generation who wants that. We, we can have, I mean, civil society is a very important force. So they can arrange these trainings and, uh, you know, sort of uh, things. That's my opinion. And you wanted to add something. Did everybody hear the question? Uh, the question is how would you would I address? The uh, would you please address uh, the subject of freedom to think from the students' point of view? I think freedom to think and freedom to learn, the two of the phrases which are in the title, right? Uh, presuppose that there is a choice. If there is no choice, then there is no freedom. Right, which is why I focused uh, in my sort of brief discussion on the idea of choice and against the idea of standardization. 
uh, because when you have standardized systems, which is what we were saying earlier, I couldn't choose a course uh, even in college. It was decided by the smart people, uh, the technocrats, what's good for me as an engineer to study. And for four years of my college, I knew exactly what I'd be studying for the next four years the day I entered. Right? There was nothing that I could do. Uh, no choice was available. So freedom to think and freedom to learn presupposes there's a choice. And the choice presupposes that there are different people who are supplying different kinds of education, which I can choose among. Right? And therefore, there has to be different kinds of schools, different kinds of universities, right? uh, different pedagogies, which are they are using different textbooks, maybe it's a hard copy, online, whatever that may be. So each child has a unique learning style. I think all of us who, have, who are parent know that very well. Right? You have two children, you know they learn very differently, even though both are your children. Right? So each child has a unique learning style, and there is no way to standardize system to teach them well. Right? And therefore, the idea of choice, competition, and freedom becomes very central to thinking about education. I think um, if, you, if you say uh, about uh, uh, the, the freedom to think means freedom to choice, and choice means have uh, m multiplicity of something. Yeah, diversity. That, uh, uh, that brings me back to the concept which I mentioned, that is diversity. Mm. Uh, the positive aspect of diversity that it offers to freedom uh, somebody to choose. Yes. Period. <laughs> Well, anyway, I think I, I would just relate to what you said about Germany. Uh, many years ago, for the first time, I had a chance to see the German school. I was horrified. That was like 20 years ago. I've never seen such a mess. Children were turning upside down the class. It was such a huge contrast, which I'm used to, because with our cult of teacher, when he enters the room, and there is total silence. <laughs> and here, and the, the, uh, the reaction of the teacher was even more amazing. He said, oh, these are, <laughs> this, is, this is how it should be. They will come down after a while. And that was a great sort of lesson to me also, what the freedom means in um, the uh, European schools and in German school, at least at the uh, r level of relations. and. Uh, egalitarian approach of the teacher to the school uh, students, I mean, at least at this level. Well, let me, we should finish now, and I uh, wanted to thank the participants uh, for their uh, very valuable contribution, very diverse contribution. I think we'll have a chance to discuss these issues in a private conversation. We were asked to come up with three uh, common points, which is exceedingly difficult, I think, <laughs> in our case, but we did come to the conclusion that uh, there is a direct dependence on the uh, way of teaching uh, education and the outcome uh, in terms of democratic thinking. Uh, it is not so much in whether it's dominated by state or it's private education, but it's about the conditions of diversity, its conditions of competition, and its conditions of choice. So if the children, if the students are facing uh, these sort of three necessary conditions at each level of the education, we, uh, there, is, there are high chances that we may end up with the responsible citizens striving for the free choice. Who knows, but um, let me just finish now. And thank you very much. Thank you.